What's up, what's up, what's up, everybody? This is Kyle Chasse and my homie Rupert. Hi, say hi, everybody, Rupert. Hi. Say hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. What do you want to say? Buy Bitcoin? Buy Bitcoin. Speak in the mic, Rupert. I can hear you. Anyway, so uh, welcome back. And thanks for uh, coming and checking out the channel. So my name, yeah, like I said, is Kyle Chasse, and I have a company called Master Ventures, and uh, we're a venture studio. And uh, before we were doing this, we felt building our own projects. Uh, I was investing in a lot of different projects, advising, and I uh, got into crypto in 2012, and I've done several things since then. If you'd like to see, you know, uh, the history of what I've done, you can check out my LinkedIn profile. Uh, link is in the description below. And uh, basically in 2018, I, after the whole 2017 ICO craze, uh, I, I kind of made two goals. One was to build infrastructure uh, so we could have adoption. And because I'm really passionate about uh, seeing the crypto space adopt and having decentralized technologies be a main uh, system that we use in the world. Uh, it would help with a lot of transparency and trust and accountability, things like that. Uh, and some of this corrupt uh, corruption that we have in the world. And the second thing I wanted to do was educate people because there's so much misinformation in the space. There's so much, uh, phew, there's a lot of people who come on YouTube, whatever, or speak at panels that have been in this space for six months or less, and uh, or even a year or less, and don't really fully understand uh, the full idea of like decentralization or even blockchain for that matter. And uh, in my opinion, they're not qualified to be giving advice or perspective or anything like that on the, the topic. So uh, what I'm aiming to do is uh, kind of share some of the news with you, my opinions about that, uh, and make sure that just you guys learn uh, the things that I've learned over the last eight years of being involved. And uh, yeah, so let's jump into it. Uh, this first article says Coinbase backed, actually, before I do that, I'll just kind of tell you what I'm going to tell you. And uh, also this, there's a lot to cover here, and the first half of it is going to be about uh, some news developments that have been happening in the crypto space, and the second half is going to be talking about the economy and coronavirus and things like that and how it will affect uh, the markets, including the crypto market. So uh, the first one here is Coinbase-backed crypto rating uh, council lists IOTA, BAT, and USDC. Uh, this is <laughs> this wasn't loading for a while, but now it is. This is just the Coinbase's council, and I'll get into that in a bit. Uh, this talks about fake volume on exchanges, Chinese regulators accusing exchanges. This one is uh, talking about the imminent pump and then a dump, which this is a technical analysis uh, article, which, as you know, I'm not a big fan of, but I'll go into it a bit and why it kind of aligns with my fundamental analysis. This is hilarious. Uh, China is known for knocking things off and just kind of doing whatever they feel is you know, best, whether it's ethically or morally, morally correct or not. Uh, this is actually very interesting. Uh, this is a, a, a blockchain protocol uh, built on ETH that is a virtual LAN kind of thing. This is very, very interesting. Um, let's see, and then more news about Telegram. And uh, this is also awesome. So GitHub is building a, like a physical permanent repository under the ice. Um, Ta uh, Fundstrat's Tom Lee talks about a, uh, a, a V-shaped recovery for the economy, which I think is nuts. Uh, this is something crazy. Okay, and this is when I get into the, start to get into the COVID stuff. Um, and at the end, I show you some really crazy things. And then it leads to a, mm, this is what the first domino uh, in this chain of events that is likely to lead to a massive financial crash. All right, so now I'll jump into it. So this Coinbase-backed crypto rating council lists IOTA, BAT, and USDC. So <clears throat> this is a, 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 like a, an organization set up by um, Coinbase and some other exchanges. Now, what they do is they give you a score from one to five uh, based on how likely a token is to be a security or not. Uh, now, I would take this with a massive grain of salt because when you look at who is backing or behind this crypto rating council, you'll see it's a bunch of exchanges or people that can benefit from determining whether the 
the asset is a uh, a utility token or a security token, which would be then allowed to be traded on a lot of these platforms uh, versus having a special license and things like that for a security token. Uh, so yeah, uh, I would take this whole thing with a grain of salt. And in my opinion, it's probably just a marketing ploy uh, where these guys are going to be listing and, dis and, and kind of uh, revealing the research that they've done on tokens that are listed on their exchanges and they're going to rate it favorably for the ones that they are trading on their exchanges and probably not so favorably for the ones that they aren't. <clears throat> um, I haven't done an extensive deep dive research into this, but this is just my opinion. Uh, so it established in September 2019, the CRC is a collaboration of major crypto firms, including popular U.S. crypto exchange and wallet service Coinbase, Kraken, Bittrex, and others, which I've showed you. Um, and they, they, that's, that's, that's about it. So, you know, they, they go in and, and they rated, um, you know, all stable coins pretty much a one, which means it's very unlikely to be security. Uh, they rated XRP a four. And I think, um, yeah, so IOTA is a two. And, um, you know, this is, again, this is something that uh, is, is, it's kind of like the one, I forget what the one from China is called, where they're also rating different cryptos on, on what they think is like a good, use case or not, which is also crazy, like it doesn't make any sense. Uh, maybe one day um, I'll do my own, uh, but but probably not, I'm pretty busy. So anyway, moving on. Uh, okay, this is um, obvious. So one of the projects I'm working on is called Crypto Exchange Alliance. And you know, the goal behind that is to, is to mature and democratize the crypto space. Right now, a lot of, uh, a lot of people think there's going to be a massive consolidation of the exchanges and we'll be left with, you know, one or two major crypto exchanges per country, something like that. And I, th I think that's an old way of thinking and an old mentality. You know, we want competition. We want there to be a ton of exchanges in the world. We want that to happen because that is going to have competition. Competition is good for us. So when you talk about exchanges, people will be competing for things like, you know, how, how do they treat the customers the best? Customer service, UX, UI, lower trading fees, you know, lower, lower uh, withdrawal fees, lower listing fees, things like that. That'll make the space more viable for everybody. Uh, so this is what the goal of Crypto Exchange Alliance is. So I've been dealing with exchanges for about you know, a year and a half now. And I have learned a lot about the way that they operate. So this is not surprising at all to me. In fact, I mean, it's something I very much have known about. And um, I'm not going to get into the article because I'll just, I'll tell you more than the article would, you know, basically what the exchanges do, because there's literally thousands of exchanges in the world, thousands of crypto exchanges. And there's not an, I mean, the crypto market space is fairly small. I mean, it's like a $200 billion uh $200 billion asset class, you know, like that is a, a small amount. So there's not nearly enough uh, volume or liquidity in the space for all of these exchanges to have actual liquidity. Um, and so that means that they can't survive off just having traders come to the platform and actually trade and make revenue on the trading fees. So what they have been doing, um, you know, is they will create massive amounts of fake volume. You know, there's been lots of reports and things that we find something between you know 85 to 95 percent of the reported volume or actually sorry the adjusted volume like say per mark per coin market cap whatever is actually fake volume and why do they do this well one everybody else is doing it but two it's it's um it's kind of it, it's not cool at all actually it's somewhat of a scam you know what, what they're doing is they're making the public think that there's a lot of volume on that exchange so that they can get projects to list the tokens on their exchanges for very uh, high amounts of money. You know, like Binance is charging a million dollars often for listings and HitBTC is doing hundreds of thousands of dollars and things like that. Uh, another thing they're doing is, you know, also charging tons and tons of money for IEOs and things like that. You know, because these projects and the public think that there's actually a lot of users on these exchanges and that the liquidity would be high and the volume would be high listing their tokens or doing IOs on these exchanges. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's really deceiving. And this is one of our goals that we do with Crypto Exchange Alliance is, is to actually, you know, connect all these exchanges, allow them to pool liquidity and trade uh, cross exchange, you know, and uh, maybe I'll do another episode on that 
down the line. It's a really important project. Uh, you know, definitely would democratize the space. It's kind of, you know, we're moving middlemen and allowing, uh, our goal is to basically allow anyone in the world to create a crypto exchange, plug into us, have instant liquidity, uh, and therefore eliminating the barrier to entry. Because the most difficult thing right now for an exchange when they, when they just get started out, you know, they can, they can go out and market to people, you know, they, they can market to uh, their local communities or their local culture, you know, like, so let's say that you have somebody in Uganda or something like nobody at, let's say Coinbase or Binance, or whatever is going to be able to market to that, that demographic better than somebody from that area. So our goal is to, is to allow anyone in the world to be able to open up an exchange for a fairly low amount of money and be able to plug in and have instant access to liquidity so that when they start using their marketing budget to go out and recruit new traders that when they place an order, it's actually filled by somebody. You know, the reason that a lot of exchanges don't survive is because they'll open an exchange and then they have to get hundreds of thousands of users on there in order for that exchange to have enough liquidity on it so that when a trader places an order, it's actually it's actually filled by another trader. So um, I'll get into more... <laughs> Sorry, Rupert. I'll get into more detail, you know, another time. But, uh, but yeah, that's, that's that. So that's obvious news. Uh, so... Next article says 8.5, then 3,000. This trader, this trader's Bitcoin price uh, call is playing out to a T. So again, like I'm not really interested in technical analysis. Uh, it is it is something that uh, that I don't believe um, actually works in this market just because there's too much manipulation. The market cap is too small. And uh, but but why I brought this up is because it, it is playing along with my. Um, scenario of what I believe is going to happen. And this is actually very, very accurate. So this is like basically saying that there's an imminent uh, possibility for a rally to 8,500, right? And we've been seeing that, you know, yesterday we saw a pretty massive, massive uh, pump and we've seen a bit of a pullback today. However, uh, you know, this, um, you know, this uh, trader, this guy Pentar Udi goes into, you know, and, and this guy, this other um, Bitfinex trader, Joe Double Seven. Uh, says this, which is nice. You know, there is one and only one TA analysis in the world that I really respect. And just today, a few hours ago, he came up with this piece of analysis, right? So that's nice to hear. Um, and meaning that this guy's probably had a lot of good calls in the past. And um, this article actually goes into talking about some of the calls that he's made and how they're accurate. Um, but the fact that the buyers quickly stepped in to buy the dip and push a price up from thirty from thirty six hundred to fifty two hundred left Pentar Udi to suggest that Bitcoin's price is likely to rally to eighty five hundred over the short term, and you know whether that's true or not, uh, I'm not sure. But I I, I do think that this is um, the likely scenario, uh, not for any of the reasons here, but just because uh, I I think for something that they talk about actually a little bit later. Um, as a note of caution, Pentarudi warned that as a result of the current global financial panic, Bitcoin is likely to fall below 3,000 after rebounding past 8,000. <sighs> so, uh, again, like if you've been watching my, my previous videos, this is kind of what I've been talking about. Not for technical analysis reasons, but for fundamental reasons. This is my opinion, right? So, um, the next upside move could be a fake out with instability in the global equities markets and dire warnings from governments that the novel coronavirus pandemic could potentially lead to increased deaths over the next several months. A recovered 8,500 could still be a bull trap. Um, so now he, he's going into a little bit of fundamental analysis uh, in conjunction with his technical analysis. Um, in efforts to contain the outbreak in the U.S. and Europe, fail and the development of a vaccine could take 12 to 18 months. The sentiment of crypto and equities markets could take an even deeper bearish turn. So, <clears throat> yeah, this is going into, you know, the end just talks about the correlation. Uh, and basically what's going to happen is when everything crashes, people are going to going to flee for safety into cash. You know, I mean, you can't have a you can't have a good financial market if the underlying economy is in ruin, right? It doesn't make any sense. Um, that can only be propped up for so long before everything starts to fail because the government cannot bail out everybody and uh, it, it's not possible. Okay, so <laughs> this is funny. Um, only 4% of China's blockchain companies are actually using blockchain. Uh, that's insane, right? So, um, 
Mainland China has more than 35,000 blockchain companies, although in fact the vast majority of them are not using this technology. Uh, so, so, so there's a, there's this firm, Tian, this one right here. Um, if you don't look at the screen, it's Tian Yat Nancha, a business data company. As of April 1st, the total number of such companies reached 35,010. And in only one province, Guangzhou, there was more than 20,000 quote unquote blockchain companies. However, according to another company, Longhash, in mid-February 2020, approximately 70% of the total number of Chinese blockchain firms lost their legal status or lost their licenses. Blockchain in the name only. So, you, so like in, in, uh, in 2017, when we had this whole craziness with uh, the ICO thing and everybody amongst everybody in the whole world was talking about crypto and blockchain, you had companies like you know, Kodak or like whoever else. You'd have some like lemon soda company that would just throw their name blockchain in, their, in the title of their name and their stock would rise up like 30% overnight. So I guess they tried to do this again. Uh, and, and this is why it's really important to understand what blockchain is and how it works and why the company may or may not be able to benefit from it. You know, like if a project or company were to throw the name blockchain on the name of the company, and the stock were to shoot up, like it would very quickly just fall back down again, you know? And so please don't be a sucker that just sees something like that, buys into it and just, you know, it falls for this one of these fake uh, blockchain companies. This is crazy. Okay, this is a, this is cool. Like, so I, like I'm no way affiliated, nor have I bought any uh, land in the sandbox. Um, but I thought it was interesting because I am interested in blockchain adoption and it's kind of cool. This is like, this whole thing is like Burning Man on a, on a video, a blockchain video game, right? So the sandbox sells 3,400 ETH worth of virtual land in five hours. The March 31st pre-sales sold 12,384 pieces of land virtual spaces in the game in just five hours. That equates to approximately 10% of the total 166,464 pieces in the game, with most of it snapped up in the first 30 minutes. That is amazing. Uh, in this market, you know, it's so good to see that uh, projects like this are still having high demand. In fact, this has a lot of demand. So TSB has quickly become one of the most coveted blockchain games on the market with more than 40 million downloads. 40 million that's huge uh and it's and i can see why like at first i'm not really into games anymore i did that quite a bit when i was in high school um i just, I just don't have time for them anymore i guess if i didn't do anything i would, I would get more into it but um i am very very busy uh that's why i didn't make a video for the past two days because i was working my ass off so <clears throat> uh okay okay wait. um so anyway like this is and, and this makes sense too. Blockchain gaming picks up during pandemic, right? Because people are just sitting at home bored. Um, I have not. I can't tell you how many people have just hit me up like, "Hey, what's up, bro? Like, what are you doing? Uh, I'm working. Oh, I'm just bored. Lo like, like locked down. Okay, we'll do something interesting anyway. But um, but anyway, yeah, that's the case. A lot of people are just bored, uh, locked up right now, and so they are just playing video games or, or you know, and all these. There's a lot of ben like different companies and things like that that are benefiting from the the coronavirus, like food delivery. Yeah, uh, things like video conferencing. We have all these video conferences now in the blockchain space. You know, there was a lot of conferences this year that I was supposed to go speak at, and um, and instead, like they decided to either postpone them toward the end of the year, assuming that things would get better, which I'm not sure if they will. Um, but a lot of people have pivoted to doing uh, online conferences, which is not, mm, uh, <laughs> in my opinion, that it's much much worse because I would only go to conferences usually to speak and to network. But um, anyway, uh, I'm getting distracted here. Uh, so I, I took a look at this because um, what caught my attention was the fact that there's 40 million downloads. That's that's a lot. Like that's a sh that's a crap ton. Um, so let me just show you a little bit about this game because I think it's cool. It's like okay, so this is actually inside the game, and this is the land right here. Uh, and I, I don't know um, if this map will get expanded. I, I guess it probably will. Um, I, I haven't read the entire thing about it, but if you Zoom in, you can see all these pieces of land here. Oh, there's some more land over there, okay. Um, and you can see like some different people have been buying land. You've got this Atari district here. District is when um, several people buy land that are connected to each other and build like a district. 
So this whole thing like very much reminds me of like a virtual Burning Man, which is really cool. Like basically this whole thing is, is every, it's the whole, the whole reason of it is for people to be able to build games and attractions and things like that, where people can go in this virtual world and go like, just, just like go from one little uh, plot of land to the next and then go in there and they can play casinos or they can play like car racing games or they can play video games or they can do whatever, like whatever, whatever someone's imagination can, can draw up. Um, you could do it uh, at this like at this uh, sandbox thing. So you know, like at Burning Man, um, you know, if you, those of you who don't know, Burning Man is a, a a city in Black Rock, Nevada, that gets constructed like from a dry seabed, like pretty much overnight, to this huge city, uh, and eighty thousand people go out to this uh, this lake bed, uh, completely dried out over the summer in August. And it's just a massive city. And it's kind of like this, where people have you know, different camps that they set up. And each camp has a different theme. And, and when you're at Burning Man, you just go around and you just go like, oh, I'm going to go like, check out this thing right here. I'm going to go check out this thing over here, and this thing. And they can be a bunch of different things. Like at Burning Man, it's like, you know, you might have a circus at one of them. The next one might be some like party going on. The next one might be like, uh, like a, a, a yoga workshop. The next one might be like an like a orgy bus. Like the must, next one must be, might be like some food stand or whatever, you know. And, and you just go walk around all day long and just go check out all this cool stuff. There's a lot of art installations and just stuff that can keep, you know, just keep your attention. Like you would never get bored at Burning Man. And it looks like this environment is some that, so, something that someone can go into all day long and just go cruise around, try different games, you know, whatever, hang out with people. Uh, it's really, really interesting. You know, this is kind of um, what we've all kind of anticipated that the world is going to, you know, go into this digital world where people spend a lot of time in these virtual worlds. And um, like just one more thing on it, this talks about the sandbox tokens and land. And what I like about this project too a lot is that like they really are doing it in a decentralized way. You know, they they have a finite amount of land that uh, which is great. Like if you could just make new land, that wouldn't be very valuable at all, right? So you can go in there, buy land. You can do whatever you want with it. You can build stuff, something on it. You can rent it out. Uh, you can resell the land. You can build something, then resell the land. You can just you can just sit on it and hold it. You know, hopefully they get a good piece of real estate and maybe everything gets built around you. And in ten years, your land's worth a ton of money. Imagine if you had bought a piece of land back on the Las Vegas, Las Vegas Boulevard. I didn't do anything for it for 50 years and you just sat on it and now you have the, today the piece of land that's worth like hundreds of millions of dollars, right? Um, and I'm not saying that this might be worth that one day, but it, but it, maybe it would be, right? Imagine if people, if the world really did shift to where people were spending a lot of their time um, in these virtual worlds. And when, you, when VR gets a lot better, virtual reality, and we can have like a 99.99% .99 realistic experience inside virtual reality, because it will get to that point, you know, like um, imagine if someone creates a, a, uh, a civilization or a, 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 a place where it was very, very attractive, like a Las Vegas in the, in the virtual land, you know, that would be so interesting. And people would go there whenever they wanted. It wouldn't cost a lot of money. You wouldn't have to try it, like travel across the world. And you can just have a lot of fun in this virtual world. So this is just kind of some examples of what people can do with, with this land. Um, and they are running it in a, in a decentralized, like what's also really cool is they want to set it up so people can run ver like uh, DAOs, which is decentralized autonomous organizations. And uh, the whole thing is decentralized. Um, so it's, it's a really cool project. Like I said, I have nothing to do with it. I haven't bought any land. I, I just actually just found out about today. And um, I probably, um, I, don't, I, I don't think I'll be buying any type of land in here. It's just not in my wheelhouse, but um, I think it's very, very interesting nonetheless. Like imagine, like man, you just go here, you can just start, you know, racing. Like, like <laughs> imagine if, you, like in esports are getting really popular too, right? Super popular. So as this matures, right? And imagine this, these graphics get awesome and you have like this car racing track, like a NASCAR kind of thing. And people, you've got real people sitting at their computers or virtual reality headsets and they've got, they're in these cars and this race is about to happen. You got stadium full of people all around the world watching this thing. They're making bets, you know, for tokens or Bitcoin, whatever. They're like having their beers, virtual beers, whatever, just, you know, and, and this experience can get very realistic. And like, I do see the potential in this. It's very, very interesting. Um, you know, and this is just kind of a super basic thing. You know, owners of land can be players. They can also be, you know, game creators. They own the land, obviously. The lands are, are NFTs, or non-fungible tokens, right? So you buy a piece of land, you get a token that says you own the land, 
And if you sell it, you can tr sell the land, and it's all done on smart contracts, decentralized. You know, and you and what's really cool about this too is like if you if you rent your land now, it's done on a smart contract, right? So there's no question about someone breaking a lease or something like that. Like it is done through smart contracts, and it's it it's it's uh, <clears throat> governed by the the rules that were agreed to when you entered to that smart contract. Um, so this is really putting in smart contracts and, and, and the way that things are done, you know, leases between owners and renters, landlords, you know, people who, um, and also people who can go, like, you can build your virtual land and then you can charge money to come into your land, you know, and you can do whatever you want. You can say, you know, it's X amounts of money per hour, or you can have a day pass, or you come in for free, whatever the case may be, and people can advertise in here, like, it is a really interesting uh, concept that uh, I think it's really cool, um, good good use case for blockchain, and uh, it's definitely early right now, but imagine in five or 10 years what this could be. Moving on, okay, so this <clears throat> New York judge says Telegram can't distribute grams outside US either. Like, what the hell is that? <sighs> so apparently, like, I'm not gonna get too much into this article, but so Telegram says like, hey, okay, fine, you don't want us to sell in the United States, that's fine. Okay, like, how about we just uh, sell outside the States and the, in the US is like, nope, you can't do that either. And like, but dude, um, you, wh why not? And they're like, well, we just said you can't do it. Um, and they're like, but, but we don't want it. Like, okay, we just won't do it in the States. Yeah, but you can't do it to the rest of the world either. Um, so this is like really bothers me. Uh, this is, this always bothers me that the U S is always trying to police the rest of the world, you know? And I, I just think it's wrong. Like to mind your own business, try to, you know, you can regulate your jurisdictions. That's fine. Um, but when you make these ridiculous rules and you make these things that are unfavorable for people to open business there or, or conduct business or pe for people to do what they want to do with their own money and their own time and their own development and innovation, you know, if you don't allow that to happen in your country, like, okay, that's fine. That, that then, then give people the option to leave there or not participate there and do it somewhere else in the world that does allow it. Like, don't think that you can cross borders and regulate. Like, this just pisses me off. It's, it's absolutely ridiculous. So I just want to say that, like, I hope Telegram, like, it would be so nice if Telegram just, just gave the big middle finger to the states and just, con I would really rooting for Telegram on this one. Like, um, I, wasn't, I wasn't even, like, didn't buy any ton, like, not invested in this thing at all. Um, you know, I thought the, the valuation was too high when they came into it. But, um, but go Telegram. Like, I, I would love to see them just, just move forward with this anyway because, it's so ridiculous. Like a, a judge in New York says that Telegram can't do stuff outside of the states. Come on, it's stupid. Okay, so here, this is cool. Um, GitHub is 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 going to be storing. Well, I'll just let you watch the video and you can check it out. Deep in the Arctic Circle, an archipelago covered in ice, Svalbard, home to the northernmost town in the world, to thousands of polar bears. And it is here you can find the global seed vault. Millions of seeds have been sent here from across the globe for secure long-term storage in cold and dry rock vaults. Just down the road is a decommissioned coal mine that has taken on new life. This is where we will protect open source software for future generations. Deep within the permafrost layer, which can stretch up to 400 meters thick, we will store the world's open source software on silver halide film. The data is encoded on frames with 8.8 .8 million pixels each and designed to last over 1,000 years. In our initial deposit, we archive thousands of the world's most depended on open source projects. the work of hundreds of thousands of developers from around the world.
we will return next spring. During the perpetual light of the midnight sun. To deposit every active public repository on GitHub. For safekeeping in the GitHub Arctic Code Vault. Cool. So that's that. I think that's cool. Like, um, yeah, that's pretty self-explanatory. But uh, I love open source, and uh, let's preserve it. You know, who knows? Like, like you want to have a, some crazy crap that goes down, and all repositories get lost or whatever. Like, that's a good idea. We're storing the seeds. Might as well do that too. Okay. Uh, so. <laughs> Tom Lee from Funstrat thinks that we're just going to like just do a V-shaped recovery, which is basically just this. So uh, we're doing okay, doing okay, doing okay, and then just crash, and then just dip for a second, and then just oh, back to normal, like nothing happened. Uh, it's, to me, that's insane, right? Like, like, <laughs> um, like, how could you, uh, I mean, if you are... If you're paying attention to what's going on in the world, um, how can you assume that we're going to have such a quick recovery when we tank, right? Like, and, and I don't even know if, if, uh, if Tom has, has um, assumed that we've already hit the bottom of the V. Like, I, it doesn't really make that clear in this, um, in this article. But uh, something I'm about to get into next is like, like, look how crazy this is. This is the history of the United States since 1967, okay? Unemployment. A little bit, little bit, little bit. I mean, it's probably, it's probably more, but little bit, 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 little bit. Oh, great, great recession of 2008. Here we go. It's right here. It's a little, little blip right there. See that one right there? That was it. That was our recession, right? Look at at this line way up here and it's not even it's more than that it's, it's a seven million we had 10 million file for unemployment in the last two weeks it, this this chart should be up here actually it's off the charts literally off the charts i mean it's nothing to laugh at it's not so sort of funny actually it's very serious but but seriously though like how how can how can we just recover from something like this it doesn't make any sense at all. During an interview on the on the scoop, Lee said that while the economic data will continue to be brutal, last week's stock market action indicates a possible bottom for the market. He added, "Further bad data might be priced in if that's the case." Come on, what? Stocks did something really important last week. Lee said, "Equity markets has found some stability." Again, come on. If you know why it found stability, Tom, is because the U.S. pumped in six trillion dollars into it that's why it found some stability otherwise it would have just free fall into oblivion like like i do not understand at all the mentality behind this and people people just go oh this guy must be smart like he works he's you know the financial analyst he's on he's on the block crypto he's in a lot of other media like probably knows what he's talking about but but i just feel like it like it's it's irresponsible to make comments like this Lee reemphasized his claim today on Twitter, something to keep in mind. 2001, 2003, and 2007, 2009 bear market, stocks bottom before peak joblessness claims. Well, we have not, okay. We haven't even begun to see the jobless claims. This is just the past two weeks. Are you assuming that, that, um, that we're stabilized now and that things are going to get better? No, not at all. That's that's that would be crazy to think. Like, um, if that market tourism holds, or truism, sorry, if that market truism holds, uh, and March twenty third is the true bottom, <laughs> back of the envelope math suggests a three month recovery contingent on a total case count peaking in April. What the fuck? Like. We're not even going to be done with Corona in three months, Tom. There's not a chance in hell. It, like, it's not, it's like, 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 this is just ridiculous. So getting into this a bit deeper, let's check this video out. All right, Miguel, thank you. Now to the staggering toll at American jobs. Unemployment claims skyrocketing to unprecedented levels with 6.6 .6 million people filing in the last week alone. Here's Jolene Kent. 
Tonight, the U.S. economy is in free fall and millions are desperate for cash. Juanita Flores and her fiance were both furloughed from their jobs in New Mexico. We're already living paycheck to paycheck, already behind in bills. They now joined the record 6.6 .6 million Americans who filed unemployment claims last week, last about week. double the week before, totaling a stunning 10 million in just two weeks. Compare that to claims filed over the past 50 years, including more than 650,000 a week at the peak of the Great Recession. The astonishing numbers reflect the new reality of businesses large and small shutting down to adhere to stay-at-home orders across the country. Families got to eat, bills got to get paid. Just so much uncertainty to, you know, have to live with. Uh, I've had to file for unemployment. Andrew Paris recently lost his bartending job in Pennsylvania. He's struggling to get unemployment benefits, worried about paying an overdue medical bill for his prosthetic leg. I've called the line hundreds of times, uh, only gotten a busy signal or disconnected. Um, I've tried email. State unemployment offices are simply overwhelmed. Texas now has virtual chats to answer questions. New York dedicating 700 staffers working remotely to help process claims. And Minnesota is requesting people apply on certain days of the week based on the last digit of their social security number. It's building the plane as we're flying it, I think, uh, and doing the best we can. In February, Colorado's unemployment office averaged about 1,000 calls a day. This Tuesday, 225,000 came in. They've added workers to try to keep up. Is your office able to keep this all moving forward and under control? Moving forward and under control um, are, are two words we strive for. I think we need to do the best we can every day. As for those $1,200 relief payments, they should start arriving by the week of April 13th, according to a memo from congressional Democrats. But for some who do not have direct deposit information on file with the IRS, it could take longer. But tonight, the Treasury Secretary says he wants it to be within weeks, not months. All Buster. right, Joe Ling, thanks very much. And for the millions of small businesses now shut down, owners can apply for emergency loans beginning at 12.01 tomorrow morning. Tom Costello has details for us. From two small towns in America, first-hand accounts of the crushing toll on small businesses. In Great Falls, Montana, Access Fitness Health Club is closed. Owner Keith Hamburg is not charging his 3,000 members their monthly dues, but is still paying his 41 employees. If we lost half of our members and they didn't come back, uh, I, don't, I don't see how the business would be viable past... Uh, a couple of months. Across the country in Frederick, Maryland, Stover, Hearth, and Patio has been a family business for generations. Spring is crucial for patio sales, but they too are closed while still paying their seven employees. It's disheartening. You, you see a, a store that was built literally brick by brick by, you know, the, the generation before us, and, and we have never been shut down for more than a day in our 42 year history. Christy Stover says at one minute after midnight, she'll be online signing up for that emergency help through the Paycheck Protection Program. Businesses with 500 or fewer employees can apply for the loan offered through their existing banks or approved lenders. Repayment will be forgiven if all employees continue to be paid. But banks say there are too many unanswered questions, like are the banks responsible for ensuring a loan application isn't fraudulent? Will the federal government guarantee loans if they go bad? The intention is to get this money out, but let's put it in perspective. This is a brand new program, $350 billion, and we don't know all the rules yet. You can't do that overnight. Tonight, the nation's biggest bank, Chase, says it will most likely not be able to start processing loan applications tomorrow because it says it needs more guidance from the government. Lester? <clears throat> And there's, it's not going to happen anytime soon, right? They're not going to be able to make the decisions on these hard questions. Like what I, I was looking up, I couldn't even find what it means when they talk about a loan could be forgiven. You know, that could have a lot of, like that, it's such a general terminology. Forgiven could mean that, that some of it may not be able to be repaid back or all of it doesn't have to be repaid back or maybe there's like um, special interest rates or whatever. The, the terms are very unclear. And um, But that video just goes to show you that um, that's 10 million unemployed the last two weeks. And there's businesses, like there's tons, I mean, I've been a business owner myself and like I know that there's probably countless other businesses right now just holding on as long as they can, but week after week after week, 
it'll be like dominoes, you know, like they'll just start sh- all start shutting down because they'll realize that this thing's not going away anytime soon. And they, they can't just keep paying people with no business coming in, you know. And so this is going, the, the unemployment rate is going to skyrocket still. And it's going, it, it, the whole entire economy is just crumbling. So here's one of the questions that I had. It's like, it's like, okay, so when you're trying to wrap your head around this whole thing of how long will it last, you know, I was trying to figure out, you know, okay, so let's say that, um, okay, so it seems like, uh, you know, we can tell from China that like isolation and social distancing and not going outside, basically locking yourself inside your house for some time does, does um, really slow down the rate of the spread of this virus. Um, however, you know, like we, we've seen one, I'm not sure which province it was in, in um, or county in China, but you know, what they did is, is it seemed to be subsiding the whole contagious thing. And uh, so they started allowing people to go back out and, um, you know, business to continue. And they started seeing a large outbreak again. Um, I think you'll see it later on this uh, chart I'm about to show you or this map. So, so let, let's just think about this for a second, right? Okay. So let's say that, um, and, and you don't even have, you know, we don't even have all of the, um, in, in this video I'll show you in a second, um, not even all of the states in the states are actually doing self-quarantine or isolating. Like, uh, I think there's like 12 or 14 states that still aren't doing it. And, um, and I don't necessarily, hmm, they're worried about their economy. And, and so it's very interesting. Like, like if, if I were to be governor of uh, um, a jurisdiction, I'm not sure what I would do because uh, when you look at this, in this article I'll get into in just a bit, a minute here, um, they think that in order for this to go away, we're going to need to have this massive, uh, massive basically um, resistance to this virus and that's either going to come in one of two ways. And uh, it's going to have to run its course. Like just isolating um, I don't think is going to stop this thing from happening because what's going to happen is like, is there's going to be this fine balancing act of when do you let people go back to work? When do you open businesses again? And the longer every single day that, that we're not operating businesses, the worse and worse and worse the economy is getting and the closer it becomes to that critical point of no turning back, you know, which I think we might be at already. But like, uh, so this is talking, okay, so there's a, there's, a, uh, there's a store around the corner, but Harmansi says she's still struggling to figure out when it's safe for her to leave the house without infecting other people. So this is someone who had the, the virus and she's feeling better, but she's not sure, you know, how contagious she is, she is and when she should be go back out, you know, to do groceries and things like that because she's being responsible and doesn't want to infect other people. Uh, every... Everyone has a doctor friend or a doctor relative who is going to tell you different things, she says. She's heard that she could, <clears throat> she should wait seven days without a fever or seven days without any symptoms or even as long as 40 days. So the thing is that people, like, we just don't know about this yet. We, there's just not enough evidence. There's just not, not enough data. We don't even know if it goes away, if it could come back yet. You know, so it's, so, it's still super, super early. Uh, so, and then, okay, so one study out of Germany that hasn't been peer-reviewed showed that the people who had COVID-19 but weren't hospitalized had high levels of the, no, no, of the novel coronavirus in their respiratory tract early on in their illness. The levels dropped off after four or five days of symptoms, and by the 10th day after they got sick, there was hardly any virus left. A study of hospitalized patients in China, though, found that the virus was, was detectable for up to 20 days after symptoms had started. But levels also dropped off when symptoms did. So, so they're saying that like onset of this virus could take from the from the time that you're contaminated, or can, uh, you, you it could be up to like eleven days before you feel symptoms, right? And then 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 we're saying that this could be either twenty days detectable, and if you're detectable, that means you still could possibly potentially pass this on to somebody, right? And it only takes one person to pass it off to somebody else before they pass to somebody else, and then we get the whole entire thing happens again globally that's all it takes so in my opinion it's going to be extremely difficult to actually get this thing to go away like if not impossible uh and so in another article it goes into talking about how that could possibly um happen here's another interesting aspect about how it's affecting the um just different perspective on how it's affecting the economy landlords in peril as chains like h&m refuse to pay rent so this picture right here 
shows you massive uh, H&M shop and like it's, it's, it's huge. The, the thing is, it's like this one here, this is expensive rent and whoever owns a building has to pay the mortgage on that and they rely on, I used to be in commercial real estate actually, so I, I know how these leases work. Basically, you know, whoever buys this building, uh, they put a tenant in there like H&M and H&M pays them rent every single month and they rely on a lot of that rent in order to pay off the mortgage. So if someone like H&M doesn't pay the rent for several consecutive months, the landlord is now at problems with the bank of not being able to make their mortgage, which means that you're looking at repossessions and you're looking at something similar to what happened with the 2008, 2008 uh, real estate bubble that popped in the whole um, mortgage-backed securities and all this crap that failed, right? So look, look at this, the retail just <laughs> falls off a cliff, right? Just tanks. Landlords will, fa will face steep shortfalls in income if most retailers withhold rent on stores they cannot operate. That would make it harder for property companies to pay interest and avoid covenant breaches on loans. In the worst case scenario, if there's no forbearance from lenders, banks could call in loans and repossess assets. <sighs> so this is just what I just, just talked about. Like, so you, like, and, and then now you're going to have, so now what you're going to have is if, if this, if this holds true, if, if retailers stop, stop paying their, their rent and then the landlords stop receiving rent and therefore they can't pay their mortgage, then banks will have to come in and start repossessing the assets. And then in order for them to, uh, stay, stay above ground themselves, they need to actually liquidate those assets, meaning sell them off. But the problem is, is that nobody's going to be buying like in commercial real estate, if you want to sell an asset or buy one, you have to you have to bank on what that asset can generate in revenue. So commercial real estate isn't like uh, residential real estate where it's like Bob, you know, residential is like Bob and Harry go and look at, uh, so that, yeah, go and look at like a house and you know Harry Harry's like uh, like honey, I don't like the or whatever like I don't even know, but like you know it, that's based on on like looks and neighborhood and school zones and blah, blah, blah. But commercial real estate, that's based off of revenue generation potential, right? So now let's say the bank owns the building. Well, in order for them to remain solvent, they need to sell that asset, right? But if, if it's a retail building and retail doesn't even exist, who are they going to sell it to? Nobody in the right mind would go out and buy a building that they can't fill and, and generate revenue off of. So now the bank's going to sit on this asset that they can't sell or they'd have to sell for literally pennies on the dollar, which means that now the banks are going to go insolvent. So you're going to start like, like this is just, and this is going to happen with, this is going to happen with, with homes. It's going to happen with cars, anything that has to do with, with, you know, with, um, more with loans, people are going to stop being able to pay them off. Several high profile retailers across Europe have, have angered landlords and politicians by withholding payments, despite taking advantage of government emergency support H and M and Adidas sparked criticism in Germany by seeking concessions on their rent while planning to access emergency measures many in the country believe should be used to support smaller companies less able to withstand the crisis. German finance minister Olaf Scholz uh, called the sports giant behavior irritating. <laughs> so basically what happened is Adidas said, hey, you know, uh, we, we we don't have any business right now, so we don't want to. Um, yeah, so so we we're not going to pay our rent, and uh, you know, and and um, because we don't have any 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 revenue, and then they're also at the same time they're talking to the the government and and things like that and saying, hey, like yeah, we're we're in the verge of a of bankruptcy. Please give us some financial aid. You know, bail us out of this one, basically, and. People are going like, dude, if you're going to be getting financial aid, then you should definitely, like, the whole point of that is to be able to pay your damn rent and, and pay your employees, you know, to mitigate this, all the, you know, the people who are dependent on you for what you've committed to, right? And so, so Adidas has since backed down, paid its rent and apologized. You know, the, the thing that's crazy to me, right, is that, you know, all these big companies and institutions are, are going to get bailed out by these um, by these stimulus things, right? And, like, it's crazy to me, like, some, like the Hilton hotels, right, and the cruise lines and things like that, that make billions of dollars a year in revenue um, because they don't have revenue coming in for one, two, three months, 
now all of a sudden they're on the verge of going bankrupt. Like, come on, that's ridiculous. You know, it doesn't make any sense. You know, this is this is irresponsibility from these companies. They should be they should be keeping money in a like like plenty of run, runway in reserves for things like this to happen. You know, like it's crazy that the founders of these companies could be generating hundreds of millions or billions of dollars a year, yet they don't get they don't get revenue for a couple of months and all of a sudden they're at a that the the brinks of collapse. Like that doesn't make any sense at all. It's actually bullshit. So anyway, back to this re, the people, how the people are affected here from what's going on. So check this out. If there is one image that can clearly show us how this health crisis has become an economic crisis in this country, it is this right here. The Pittsburgh Gazette captured video of hundreds of cards lining up for the Greater Pittsburgh Food Bank before it opened yesterday. Some waited five hours as volunteers distributed emergency supplies to 1,500 families, and then they ran out. A new reality for those in need. Rick Paulson is the volunteer coordinator for the Joint Hands Food Pantry. He says they've been holding the food pantry for 15 years, but have never seen it like this. It's almost as uh, out of a 1950s movie or a bad dream. It's just it's so surreal. On this day, 7,200 pounds of food was given away from the Chicago Food Depository, and it went fast. We had so many calls from people, and we knew they were first-time people because they were asking where the location was. Just moments ago, the Labor Department put out its statistics a jaw-dropping 3,283,000 mm. jobless claims were filed last week. 3,283,000 jobless claims. That number okay. dwarfs any other week on record. Joining us now, former Treasury official and Morning Joe economic analyst Steve Ratner. We are, we are clearly in a major recession with major impacts on working men and women in this country who are not going to have their jobs. The highest we saw during the Great Recession was 665,000. And this may well only be the beginning. If you looked at this scene in black and white, you would think you're back in the 1920s or 30s during the era of the Great Depression. The line outside the Bowery Mission stretches down that street in that direction, and it comes back in this direction as well. They say that the line is getting longer and longer each day that this coronavirus crisis drags on. Uh, this has always been a destination for the city's poor and homeless, but now they're seeing a lot of new faces in the crowd, they say. People who have lost their jobs, people who are not getting paid, people who are here for, at a food pantry for the first time. Here, they think they have enough food for about a week or so. That number that we've been looking for just crossed, and you'll forgive me if my jaw's on the ground. U.S. weekly jobless claims total 6.6 6 million. Oh, versus 3.1 million expected. 6.6 million unemployment claims were made in this country last week. Think of that in human terms of each individual. Most of them have worked hard and long at their companies. They have pride in their work and they're gone through no fault of their own. What we've seen through this COVID-19 crisis is that there are so many more people looking for food assistance right now. It is folks that are maybe from the service industry, from the hospitality industry, and they are seeing themselves being furloughed or out of work for potentially for the first time. So for example, our mobile pantry sites, usually we have about 300 households that come. And with these distributions that we've had in the last few weeks, we've had upwards of a thousand households come. So that is a huge increase. So, so now you're seeing some of the stuff from from inside of the the battlegrounds here, right? It is, it is brutal. Um, uh, yeah. So, what 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 we see? If you're, this is why I'm I'm talking about this because if all you're doing is paying attention to charts or the price, whatever. Um, then you might think that you know the economy is not doing so bad because it's. I mean, you know. Stocks are doing okay right now. Bitcoin's kind of stable. Crypto's kind of stable, right? But it is a facade, right? And this is what the government wants you to believe, that everything's doing so well. Like, like I just heard something from Trump the other day who said, our economy is so strong. Like, what the hell are you talking about? We The, the unemployment rate is exponentially higher than it's ever been before. And he's saying our economy is strong. What are you talking about? Uh, 
yeah, this is um, okay. So, the, the, so I, I was talking about this earlier. Basically, you know, eleven days from the time the first infected, um, and this is just, this is I was just doing some research on on uh, you know how long be, it would take in order for and, and basically this is just, there's just no answer. We don't know, and uh, I'm going to jump ahead to. Okay, this is crazy, um, but let, let me show you this first. Okay, so th I haven't seen this map before, but it's pretty interesting. And uh, I'm just going to push play over here, and you're going to see uh, these little things pop up. Which the red, like in this circle, for example, the red represents how many are, have been confirmed, and then you'll see the green, which is recovered, and then you'll actually see, see some gray areas in there. Um, in the circles that represent the deaths, right? And look at this. Like, for anyone who thinks that that we are, you know, we're going to be through this thing in the next couple of weeks or or month or something, uh, you are sadly mistaken, my friend. Like, look at this. This is the new confirmed daily global amounts, right? So this is every tick is every day. This is how many eighty six thousand new cases yesterday alone. 78,000 the day before. It is getting it is getting higher exponentially higher and higher every single day. It is exploding still. Anyone who thinks that, that this is going to be over in time soon is delusional. Right? So um but watch this. Okay, so check this out. So this is starting on this this is going to hit this is starting on the 1st of January. Um Oh, sorry, 21st of January, 2020, and then goes up until today. China, China, a little bit in the States, a little Russia, probably people here. Now watch what starts to happen. And all of a sudden, right around the beginning of March, we start to see an explosion. Look at this. Just China's going crazy. Boom. Now it's just everywhere in the world. You've got Europe over here. Boom. Now just going crazy. Like this is where it stops. Right? So let's just go back here to where it is today. Look at this. You don't see, like, China's the only place where you start to see some recovery, right? Um, like, where it's outpacing the rest of it. But for the rest of the world, like, this is fairly new still, right? Like, you're still seeing, when you go over here to Europe, I mean, this is almost entirely red. We're, there, there's no, this is, there's nothing here that suggests that that we're at, you know, there's, there's light at the end of the tunnel right now. Nothing. Brutal. Okay, so how does this end? There's a consensus that the pandemic will only end with, it, with the establishment of a so-called herd immunity. That occurs when people, when enough people in a community are protected from the pathogen that it can't take hold and dies out. There are two paths for that outcome. One is immunization. Researchers have to develop a vaccine that proves safe and effective against the coronavirus. And health authorities would have to get it to a sufficient number of people. The second path to herd immunity is grimmer. It can also come about after a large portion of the community has been infected with the pathogen and develops resistance to it in that way. <clears throat> so still there's just so many unanswered questions still for this to even be but this is you know so i think like i said i think there's like something like 14 states in the states who are not quarantining yet and uh i think it was the governor of oklahoma maybe who who made some public speak uh talk about it who said that you know it's just not economically viable to shut down right now and uh, a lot of people might think that that's crazy and irresponsible um but if <clears throat> sorry if this is going to have going to be what has to happen, uh, where this herd immunity is the result of of letting the virus take its toll, 
then what they're doing is the only way to keep their local communities or economies um, moving forward. Everything else is just at a standstill. I mean, it's crazy. A lot of people, most people live paycheck to paycheck. And when you're not getting a paycheck, like how are you going to pay for things, you know? Um, so it is, it's very hard to, to take a opinion on, you know, what is the right move here? And, um, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, but to kind of wrap things off, uh, FDIC announces first bank failure of coronavirus crisis. So this was a fairly small bank in West Virginia. Uh, it has become the first institution to fail during the coronavirus crisis. The FDIC announced Friday. The first state bank of Barbus, Barboursville with 152 million assets was closed Friday by the West Virginia Division of Financial Institutions. The bank's 139.5 million deposits will be acquired by MVB Bank. Uh, Fairmont, West Virginia, the four branches of the first state will reopen as a branch of MVB Bank opens on Saturday, the FDIC said. So this is the first of things to come, and I know it will not be the last. Uh, and one more thing, too. When you look at – so <clears throat> what, there's there's been several p different people. I, I didn't include all of this because this is a long video already. But a lot of people have think that maybe the market has bottomed out, right? But this is the S&P 500. And when you zoom out, this is today, right? So the price right now is at some, the 24.88. But when you zoom out, and you go back to 2008, sorry, the bottom was in 2009, and this was the Great Recession, right, that started in 2000, like early 2008 um, or late 2007. So it bottomed out around 673 or something like that, right? And so we're still f four times higher than this number. And if you go back to the unemployment ch chart, this is – we, at this time, it was a fraction, a fraction of the percentage of people that are unemployed right now currently. So for anyone who thinks that, that, we, that this is not, you know, maybe we hit the bottom already and things are just going to get better from here, or this like Tom's like V-shaped recovery, thinking that we've hit the bottom, you're out of your mind. There's no way. Um, there, there's no, there's no amount of printing money. Like you can just print money all day long and pump it into this, you know, try to prop up this economy, but you're just going to devalue the dollar, and it's still not going to give people jobs back. So, the underlying economy is still going to collapse no matter what. You know, you can save big companies and banks by just giving them a bunch of money, so they like. But this, this is you can't just do. I mean, you can if you want to, but it's not going to give people their jobs back. So. Anyway, um, so like, I just wanted to make people, everybody aware of what's going on and uh, and how this correlates to you know why this is important for you know people like who are watching this and might be interested in Bitcoin price things like that. Um, an interesting thing to, to note is that one way that the government is going to try to bail this whole thing out is they're going to print a ton of money, right? And and that might work for a while. Like that like in 2008, the economy should have just collapsed, right? It could have just should have just cr just crumbled. But it didn't because we had this massive stimulus thing. We bailed everyone out and then life went on as normal and it wasn't that bad. Um it really wasn't that bad at all. I mean, it was bad, but like it wasn't that bad. And so, you know, I was talking to some of my friends today earlier and I said, you know, well, they, they, they were able to stop a Great Depression by, by printing a bunch of money and throwing it into the, the markets. You know, what's to prevent them from doing it this time? Well, they, they're already doing it, right? But this is, a, this is a good case for Bitcoin. Like, if they continue to print, they, they could try. They can try printing trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars and just creating tons of money and paying everyone off and giving people... But, all that's going to do is devalue the dollar. You're going to start to see hyperinflation at that point. And what does that do when you have a massive supply increase in one asset? 
the other assets that have a finite supply increase in value versus that asset. So Bitcoin, you cannot print anymore. It's got 21 million never printed. And that's it. So as you start to see the supply of the US dollar and other fiat currencies massively increase and hyperinflate, the value of the, of the Bitcoin versus those assets is going to massively increase. All right, guys. Uh, anyway, that's the end of this. I know it's a long video. Thanks for sticking with me. And uh, yeah, I hope everyone has a wonderful day or evening, wherever you are. And uh, thanks for tuning in. Please like and subscribe. It would be greatly appreciated. Um, I would love to continue to do this for everybody. It does take a lot of time and I am super busy. Um, but please let me know in the comments what you might like to see or hear or talk about. Any questions you might have, I'm happy to help out. Like This is why I am here. Thank you everybody so much. Have a wonderful day, evening, afternoon, whatever, and I will see you soon. See ya.